start to today's Ostrom Workshop Colloquium series. I'm Shelley Settles. I'm with the O'Neill School currently, but I was formerly with the Workshop Sustainable Food System Science Working Group. Uh, today, I would like to introduce everyone to Dr. Andrea Silva. She is an assistant professor of political science at the University of North Texas. She's also affiliated uh, faculty member with UNT's Latino Mexican American Studies Department. Her research interests include US immigration politics and federalism, Latinx politics, representation, as well as racial and ethnic politics in the United States. So today, Dr. Silva will be speaking to us about state immigration policy and direct democracy mechanisms, looking at political opportunity structure and political actors. So uh, Dr. Silva will speak for about 25 minutes and then the remainder of the hour will be used for discussion. Uh, you can feel free to use the hand wave button on Zoom or put questions in the chat, bo chat, chat box and I will keep track of those um, so that we are able to structure our questions that way. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Silva. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, everyone. I, um, I, I'm Andrea Silva. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone so much for taking the time. Um, I'm sure you had a lunch that was uh, very tempting. So I really appreciate you, uh, you know, also paying attention to what's going on with uh, my work here. Um, I would really appreciate any suggestions to improve the project. I'm currently looking to uh, get it published. Uh, somewhere and so also maybe some suggestions about what what journal might be a good fit for this work um, as a political scientist. Um, most of the American politics stuff leans towards quantitative analysis and that's not really what I'm trying to do here so uh, I would appreciate any help uh, in the suggesting of, of a place where I can submit this that might you know appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay. Before I get started, can everyone just, I just want to make sure everyone can see my presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the my project is um, looking at the effect of direct democracy mechanisms on state immigration policy. Um, what I'm looking at is not just the, the structures or the institutions that are um, the institutions that are present or conventional institutions that we think about, but also the interaction between those institutions and issue actors, or how issue actors use these institutions uh, to reach their policy goals. So um, for at the beginning of American politics with respect to immigration, it was actually states that were in charge of immigration policy. States were the ones that would identify who and under what conditions immigrants would be able to come. Uh, one notable example is California's Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in the late 1800s uh, that eventually became the uh, American Federal Chinese Exclusion Act of 1880. Um, but from those beginnings, the federal government has taken a very uh, strong hold on the creation of immigration policy at, uh, across the nation, right? So um, in the past 30 years though, we've started seeing a resurgence of state activity with respect to immigration policy and immigrant politics. Um, this uh, actually, this is a picture of uh, something that occurred when I uh, was in middle school. Uh, Prop 187 was introduced and passed in 1993. Um, and what we saw with uh, Proposition 187 was that it was a referendum or it was an initiative, right? So um, some people that had nothing to do with politics uh, wrote a bill and got it on the ballot and it passed. Um, and they literally bypassed the legislature to make that policy. Uh, so this, this question is really important because we really underestimate the important role that states play in our lives. So they uh, administer and govern our public education system. They administer our the food uh, system that we, the food um, assistance that's given at the federal level via block grants. Uh, the state administers healthcare and also uh, the state governs and administrates how people get licenses, right? So uh, doctor's licenses, beautician licenses, 
uh, licenses to carry arms, firearms. I'm in Texas, so that's a big thing. Uh, and then also driver's licenses. The other thing that we've been seeing is an increase in the number of bills that are introduced um, that are introduced into uh, state legislatures. And so we've been seeing an increased number, not only of bills that are being introduced that have to do with immigrants or immigrant legislation, but also the, uh, the number of bills that are actually being enacted and passed. So I'm, I'm specifically interested in this research question. Uh, there's a, this is part of a larger book project, so there's a lot of other moving parts. But uh, for this presentation, I want to ask, you know, what are the mechanisms that link uh, direct democracy, uh, mechanisms like, uh, um, like uh, referendums and initiatives, to the outcome of state immigration policy? Uh, we can think about this using, actually, Ostrom's uh, IAD framework. Um, we think about, you know, exogenous variables. What I'm interested in is uh, a particular set of rules, a particular set of action situations, and then that interaction with the participants, right? So when uh, in the literature about state immigration policy, there are some conventional exogenous variables, right? There's uh, demographic change, the idea that you know there's more uh, immigrants coming, and that may affect how uh, state legis uh, state legislatures create policy. Uh, economic conditions. You know, one of the one of the big theories about why 187 in California passed was uh, an economic downturn the previous in the past five years, and then more recent scholarship has looked at partisanship, like the makeup of the actual um, the makeup of the actual legislature. What I'd like to suggest, or something that I think we should look at, is the another type of rule, right? Another kind of exogenous variable uh, that's direct participation of citizens in the democratic decision making process, right? Direct democracy mechanisms, mechanisms like initiatives, referenda, and recall. So we just saw Gavin Newsom um, beat a, a recall in California, right? California is. Uh, they are very good. I'm, I'm from California, by the way. And so we're very good at using these mechanisms to um, kind of do, well, I want to say crazy things, but do different things. Uh, the other thing is that direct democracy uh, has actually been used in the past um, to pass state legislation with respect to some very controversial things. So some things that you know uh, legislators won't touch uh, have been affected and changed via the direct democracy, the direct democracy mechanism. Uh, things like abortion, death penalty, gay rights, um, immigrant rights, those have all been um, adjudicated and laws have been enacted or passed uh, via the initiative process. Uh, we know that states with direct democracy mechanisms have citizens that are more efficacious and knowledgeable about the process relative to other uh, compared to other places that do not have direct democracy mechanisms. And we also know that direct democracy mechanisms, just the mere presence, and I've actually done this work and gotten it published, uh, just the mere presence of direct democracy mechanisms affects how legislators behave. So we know that direct democracy mechanisms in other contexts do affect um, the outcome, right? Do affect outcomes. So this is kind of what I'm going to be looking at here. Um, I'm going to introduce, what I want to do is I want to introduce a new exogenous variable for study, right? The effect of direct democracy mechanisms. And I, I want to introduce that new exogenous variable into uh, the fight for state driver's license legislation. Uh, the group that I'm looking at in both California and Oregon is uh, restrictivist immigration groups and how they interact not only with um, the legislation that's being passed or not passed or being uh, submitted, right, but also how they use direct democracy mechanisms to, to achieve their outcomes. So uh, my theory comes from Pearson and Gerber. Uh, you know, the idea of federalism, it, it does uh, just increase the number and power of interest groups, right? And if we think about a place where state citizens can actually bypass the legislature, those interest groups will have a lot more power in the political arena than we would assume maybe uh, in the state of Indiana, where the only type of initiative can be introduced uh, only by legislators, right? So, um, 
My argument then is that in states that have direct democracy mechanisms, we're going to see groups uh, think and move to bypass the legislature to pursue their policy preferences. They're going to be, they're going to have an incentive uh, to to bypass the legislature, right? They have they have their own opportunity to create and affect change, uh, and they don't have to worry about. Um, they don't have to worry about like negotiating with other legislators or creating like policy that's like constitutional, right? They can just like move forward with what they want. So uh, this is kind of just another way to explain the argument. Uh, what I'm arguing is uh, that the rule making uh, the, the lawmaking rules in each state are important, and also the knowledge and capabilities of these restrictionist groups, that also affects the ability of them, restrictivist groups, to make policy. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to elaborate a lot um, more on this. So from this argument, right, the idea that direct democracy mechanisms affect um, behavior, right, state actors' behavior, um, we should see this observable implication, right? If a state has direct democracy mechanisms, then we should see those groups using them, right? Uh, in any way to achieve their policy goals. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a little primer on uh, lawmaking, at particularly uh, direct democracy mechanisms, right? So this is a traditional kind of, uh, uh, I just made this up, but this is like a traditional kind of process for lawmaking, you know, people, uh, people here, these are the people uh, uh, on my uh, left, they elect a legislator, they elect a legislature, those legislators make legislation, and then they pass it on to the governor, that's the person with the fancy hat, um, and governor fancy hat, for some, you know, after it's been decided, uh, signs this bill into law, right, that's kind of the traditional way that legislation is made. Initiatives are really interesting because they literally turn that whole system on its head, right? Uh, instead of having, you know, people elect legislators who make bills and send them to the governor for signing, uh, people can write their own bills. <laughs> they don't have to have any, you know, uh, experience writing bills. Um, they can get enough signatures using a, uh, a petition to get that bill on a, a ballot, right, and then go straight to the voting, right? They can literally bypass the legislature. That's what's, uh, that's a, a, um, a traditional kind of initiative. A referendum is, is what we're going to be looking at today. This is the kind of the main thing that I'm going to be looking at today. Um, a referendum occurs uh, between the moment that a governor signs a bill and it becomes enacted, right? So a governor can sign a bill and then it becomes enacted, uh, but there's a time in between, and this is where the referendum can happen. A referendum can happen, right, during this time if citizens gather, uh, create a, 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 a piece of a, a, a bill, right, to ask for an up or down vote on this bill that has been passed in the legislature, right, and signed by the governor, um, they can get the pet a petition to put that on the ballot. And if 50% plus one, right, affirm that referendum, the people can effectively nullify a law, okay? Now, there's one special trick that legislators have up their sleeve to be able to make sure that these things don't happen all the time. And that is to include an emergency clause. An emergency clause then, oh, that's them uh, nullifying the, the bill. Bills with an emergency clause are just, it's just literally written in the bill that there's an emergency clause and that there can't be any time between when the governor signs a bill and it becomes enacted. And so when bills are passed with emergency clauses, they are, they are enacted upon a governor's signature and make a referendum impossible. Okay. Let's see. So now a little bit about referendums. So let me talk a little bit more about my, my variables that I'm interested in. 
Uh, one, I'm, I'm using Doug McAdam here uh, to, to kind of explain uh, political opportunity structures and how they're uh, set up. Uh, uh, McAdams defines political opportunity structures as like the relative openness or closure of institutionalized of the institutionalized political system. Um, kind of how willing uh, a legislature is to incorporate policy preferences from people. So we can think about political opportunity structures as a spectrum, right? Um, on the very closed spectrum, appointed legislatures. So um, in the principality of in Oman, right? Uh, the country of Oman, the Sultan uh, appoints a legislature um, and that legislature is, has no, uh, has not been elected by any, any citizens there or anything. And that legislature um, makes decisions, right? Maybe a more open type of political opportunity structure would be elected legislators, like our federal, um, our federal legislature, right? So we vote for our senator now, uh, or we vote for our house representative, and those people are elected to represent us in higher chambers. Uh, a more open, right, uh, 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 relative to these two uh, legislatures would be a place where not only are legislators elected, but also where citizens can bypass that legislature and introduce their own bills for uh, consideration straight to the public. Right. So in this case, uh, what I'd like to do is put uh, states with direct democracy mechanisms as open. I'd like to uh, uh, I'd like to categorize them as open, and places that don't have direct democracy mechanisms categorize them as closed. Okay. So my second explanatory uh, variable is state actors. Right. Um, state actors have. Uh, are really important, right? They can make political change, but they also are guides for to voters. Uh, and we can I, I try and uh, investigate and, and look at the actions of these issue actors um, based on their ability to mobilize resources, uh, to gain resources and mobilize compared to other in-state groups, right? And so um, what are some of the resources that I'm looking at here? Well, their knowledge of the political process, right? Which becomes much more complicated when you introduce direct democracy mechanisms, the resources that they hold uh, and the way that they can organize themselves quickly to move, um, to move forward with their policy preferences. So here are my, uh, here's my little two by two theoretical table uh, combining these explanations and my outcomes. Uh, this is my theory uh, that explains the likelihood of a restrictionist group blocking immigration law, right? So remember, I'm looking at, immigrate, at restrictivist immigration groups and how they can block um, pro progressive immigration legislation, okay? So on the uh, top and the left, you'll see a qualitative measure of my two variables, political opportunity and uh, the resource mobilization of issue actors. So to answer this question, I undertake a comparative case study. Um, I look at, there was a wonderful, well, for me, a wonderful moment in time where both California and Oregon were considering uh, driver's licenses or, and not requiring proof of citizenship to obtain a driver's license. Um, restrictionists could not block uh, driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants in California and uh, restrictivists in Oregon were able to were unable to block progressive immigration policy in the state of Oregon, except for driver's licenses. Um, so this is kind of an interesting puzzle. Uh, Oregon is inherently interesting because they passed driver's license legislation, but repealed it via a referendum. And California was able to pass driver's licenses uh, during the same time, right? Um, I looked at immigration laws that didn't get repealed during the same year, and I compared Oregon to California restrictionists with respect to their political sophistication, their resource mobilization, right? Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Uh, yes. So how did I collect my data? I did field interviews in March of 2015, and I triangulated those uh, field interviews with newspaper, um, with newspaper uh, stories about the issue. 
I interviewed restrictivist immigration groups in Oregon, uh, Oregonians for Immigration Reform, which was the main group that was able to put together a referenda uh, and um, invalidate the driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants in Oregon. Uh, and I was able to talk to the restrictionist groups, restrictionist groups in California and ask why they were unable to um, prevent the passage of driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants in California. So what happened in Oregon? Well, uh, on May 1st, the governor of Oregon uh, signed SB 833 and obtained, to obtain driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants in Oregon. That same day, actually at this, uh, if you look at uh, this on the left, at this same signing ceremony, um, OFER, Oregonians for Immigration Reform, declared via a press release that they were going to attempt to introduce a referendum by gathering signatures to place SB 833 on a ballot. And they were able to gather enough signatures uh, to eventually repeal that uh, driver's license bill for undocumented immigrants in Oregon. So when we, uh, on first blush, it kind of seems like, well, you know, that would make sense. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of undocumented, there's not a lot of immigrants in Oregon and there seems like there's a lot of immigrants in California that makes, you know, that kind of seems like maybe that would be the explanation for why um, uh, driver's licenses would pass in, in California and driver's licenses would not pass in Oregon. Uh, but if you look at that same legislative year, that same legislative session, uh, Oregon legislatures were able to pass three very expensive, um, expensive with upfront costs, right? Pieces of legislation that were progressive and aimed directly at um, assisting undocumented and documented immigrants, right? So cultural competency is um, requiring doctors to take a course in being culturally competent to, for multiple uh, ethnicities and, and cultures. Tuition equity is allowing undocumented immigrants to pay into tuition as long as they went to an Oregon high school. And then pre and postnatal care is uh, medical care for undocumented women, irrespective of whether they have insurance or not. So these are actually uh, some really expensive um, pieces of legislation that were passed in Oregon during that same legislative session. So there has to be, I think, something else going on. So what I found is that the bills on cultural competency, in-state tuition, and pre- and postnatal care all included emergency clauses, right? They were written in, uh, when they were written, they were written to include um, uh, an immediate inaction, right, upon a governor's signature. Uh, but to prepare for the increased number of applicants that the Oregon uh, Department of Motor Vehicles was going to gain, the... Um, the Oregon DMV asked the bill writers to exclude the emergency class so that they could prepare, right? Uh, this was the opening that uh, restrictionists in Oregon, OFER, right, uh, needed to try and repeal SB 833. Uh, but this also, this doesn't, this kind of depends on whether OFER was politically um, sophisticated enough, if they could mobilize the correct resources to make that uh, to make that uh, happen, right? Uh, so when I interviewed the president of OFER, right, uh, Cynthia Kendall, oh, thanks, um, uh, Cynthia Kendall, uh, you know, she told me that she actually didn't know what a referendum was um, and that she uh, had learned what a referendum was uh, by speaking with another group, another, um, restrictivist immigration group in the state of Washington, right? So there's like Oregon, Oregonians for immigration reform, Washingtonians for immigration reform. And then that group was the one that informed her that her group could introduce a referendum, right? So it was only uh, until, it was only after uh, Kendall was informed by a peer uh, in Washington that OFA realized that they could uh, use these institutional rules in their favor. Uh, so California was actually, so let me just switch to California. Uh, California was one of the earliest groups that were, one of the earliest states to require proof of legal presence to obtain a driver's license, right? Uh, California enacted that piece of legislation in 1993. Uh, Prop 187 passed in 1994, uh, but it was eventually struck down uh, by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and 
uh, it's lasting, the, la the legacy of 187 was that it mobilized immigrant groups in California uh, for the next 20 years, right? So I, I don't know if anybody's heard of Pete Wilson, probably not, but before 187 and his support of, of, uh, of Prop 187, he was on track to be like a presidential candidate, right? So this Prop 187 really derailed his political career. Um, how do we know that California made the switch? Well, in the past, uh, in the past uh, 20 years, California has passed some of the most immigrant progressive pieces of legislation. Uh, In-state tuition for um, AB 540, in-state tuition for uh, uh, students uh, to public universities and colleges, uh, scholarships for non-state fun, uh, non funds allows undocumented students to get scholarships to go to college, that's the DREAM Act. Um, 2013, uh, the Trust Act, right? And also this passage of driver's licenses for undocumented people. Uh, when I looked and tried to find where restrictionists were here, Right, and what kind of battles they were passing or uh, they were uh, undertaking in California, they were nowhere to be found. I couldn't find uh, any discussion of like protests or um, meetings or, you know, uh, media meetings, nothing. The most I could find was um, two people uh, submitted testimony for the Driver's License Act against allowing undocumented immigrants to have driver's licenses. And when I asked one of the leading uh, restrictivist legislators, uh, Ken Donnelly, uh, Tim Donnelly, he said that they didn't have enough people, they didn't have enough money, and they didn't have enough uh, time, right? Because they had been fighting other wars or, you know, they had been fighting against the DREAM Act and the Trust Act. They literally didn't have enough resources to mobilize one more time against driver's licenses. So with respect to each state then, although the institutional rules were open for both California and Oregon, the institutional rules were not enough for California restrictionists to be successful. And even though, even though they knew the rules of the game, they didn't have the capacity, right, to, to block driver's licenses in California. Oregon restrictionists though, were able to learn the rules, scrape together enough money, uh, and bring SB 833 to a referendum, uh, knowing that most people vote no on referendums anyway, uh, and, and they would probably lead to their victory. So if we populate my, uh, my little theory table again, uh, Oregon and uh, California have open political opportunity structures. Both states have direct democracy mechanisms, uh, but one, one group had a, a one group had the opportunity, and that was Oregon, to introduce a referendum because of the missing uh, emergency clause. Uh, okay. So here are my implications revisited. What we did see in this case is that, you know, interest groups are exploiting referendums to achieve their policy goals. But it's not just about the rules of the game, right? It's about how people and issue actors are able to learn and um, and play the game, right? And play the game to win. So it's not just, uh, it's kind of like playing poker, right? It's not just that you know the rules of the game, but are you a skilled player, right? Can you use your resources and your time um, and your organization in ways that will lead you to win, okay? So it's not just rules, but it's also uh, the need for sophisticated actors. So uh, along with race and partisanship, uh, these uh, conventional exogenous variables, we should also be looking at the rules of the game, right? When we talk about immigration, uh, state immigration politics, uh, because it's those rules that are making change. Uh, this is actually really important because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to turn to look at food policy at the state level. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, uh, as we move forward with our, with this research, you know, what kind of groups out there are affecting uh, the type of food policy that's being created at the state level, right? If we think about uh, states as smaller ponds, right? Uh, and we think that uh, issue actors have more power at the, state, at the state level, 
how are they influencing the creation of food policy? How are they influencing the creation of um, how people get assistance, right? And so that's kind of the next, the next thing that I'm thinking about. Okay. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Silva. So I will open it up for questions from the audience. And feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, I will start with a question then. So, uh, Dr. Silva, I was, you know, very curious to see, you know, kind of the outcomes that happen for tuition equity and postnatal care, which are very expensive. So when we think about food policy and knowing that food policy in the United States is very much tied to food and agricultural programs, um, particularly given the Farm Bill, is a massive amount of federal funding, federal spending. In your experience, is there are there differences in outcome of direct democracy and those interested actors as it relates to allocating funding versus you know, creating restrictive policies that aren't necessarily tied to funding? Yeah, that's actually kind of what I think I that's like the next kind of thing that I'd like to be that I'd like to kind of investigate. So I uh, lived in Salinas, California for a couple of years, and I'm not sure if anybody knows about that place, but it is they like to call themselves the salad bowl of America uh, because they are the place where most if not all of uh, your vegetables come from right so your uh, lettuce anything that has to be picked lettuce strawberries uh, broccoli all of that stuff a lot of it comes from Salinas uh, and and we know California makes a, uh, makes allowances for farmers right um, to have particular types of uh, subsidies or, or advantages Right, and, and we also know that California kind of turns its head um, when it comes to the people that work those fields and, and the requirement for them to be citizens or employed or, um, or well taken care of. And so that's kind of the next part of this work. Um, you know, what is it gonna, what is, uh, what is the actual, what do state, how do state actors affect this environment? How do they affect that institution and the creation of policies around that institution? I am just starting, right? And so you're the food policy expert. And so I hope I can glean some of your expertise on that. Um, but I'm really interested in kind of like, how does federalism affect food policy and food assistance for, uh, for immigrants? Excellent. Thank you for that. I will. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any additional questions. Or I see Eric has his hand up. Go ahead, Eric. Hi, great presentation, Andrea. <clears throat> um, I was wondering um, how the organizations uh, think of themselves. Do they conceptualize themselves as a, like do they recognize that they're in a minority and are using this as their only option to get around a majority in the legislature or maybe do they see themselves as acting in the public good against a captured uh, legislature? Like how do they conceive of themselves? That's a really great question. Uh, when I interviewed um, Oregonians for immigration reform, they were very, uh, they were very, they were convinced that they were representing a silent majority against, you know, these, um, you know, crazy liberals that are trying to, you know, change immigration policy in Oregon, right? And that they were trying to protect Oregonians from the dangers of uh, having immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants drive, right? And so a lot of this, uh, a lot of the restrictivist movement, especially in the West Coast, has like an environmentalist tinge. And so the, it, there's a kind of a connection between like overpopulation and environmental problems. And so um, that was very much in the repertoire of, of uh, the, the, the kind of repertoire of what Oregonians for Immigration Reform were telling me. Um, when I spoke to uh, Tim Donnelly, the California assemblyman who was a restrictive immigration policy supporter, um, I think he understood that he was in the minority, uh, but that the fight had to had to happen. It was a good fight, and that it had to it had to happen, right? And so I don't 
I'm not quite sure um, if that, I think Tim Donnelly and the California restrictionists are realists. And I think the, uh, the Oregonians for immigration reform are uh, not. <laughs> I don't know sure. about that. Sorry. Thank you very much. Insa? Yeah, but the thing is, well, that, that's very fascinating, particularly the idea of transforming it to the food sector. Um, I, I would be interested to, to know a bit more why exactly did you choose to uh, analyze so late in the policy cycle how these groups can influence. I mean, there would have been many steps before to so not even getting it so far. And uh, I think what you just elaborated a little bit on the food policy is that the move, so there you will not look at the referendum stop, stopping uh, law, which is already in place, but there you want to look at the agenda setting. Or maybe you can explain that a little bit, your, your ideas related to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so how do you, um, so why choose so late in the game, right? Why, why does that matter? Um, you know, well, I think it's important because, because all of this really did happen so late in the game in Oregon, right? It, for the longest time, I mean, uh, maybe the three years leading up to the passage of this bill in Oregon, uh, the Oregon legislature was like, this is a slam dunk. There's no need to worry about this. The agenda is like we're gonna get undocumented immigrants like driver's licenses, and that's it. And um and and there's nothing nobody can say about it. And that's just how it's gonna be, right? And so, to me, it was really interesting that this like literally done deal had been overturned by this group of people who you know upon personal you know ocular inspection didn't really understand what was going on, right? It was really interesting to me to see, um, just like you mentioned, at the, the last moment of the game, these folks were able to, I don't know, what is it, in, like call an audible? Is that the football term? And just totally change the game, right? Um, I think, uh, but I think you're right in saying that this may not be something that occurs regularly. Uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, this food project is going to be a larger discussion of uh, how interest groups start or actors start at the beginning of the agenda, right? How, how is it what they, how is what they're doing fundamentally changing the outcome, right? So yes, I completely agree. Next we have Brian. Okay, <laughs> thank you. A bunch of interesting issues. Um, I guess in terms of comment, I'm not a political scientist enough to say about particular journals and what have you, but there certainly would seem to be a bunch of ways to link this with larger issues. And in that sense, you know, what you were saying about the kind of longer term consequences of 1993 in terms of mobilization of Latinx voters, you know, seems to be, you know, a big one and something you maybe could hook on, um, as well as contemporary political position, identity, nativism, um, you know, all those kind of things and what the internet does to make it easier for people to find like-minded people and mobilize, um, you know, all that kind of context. My question, more in terms of Austrian workshop or so on, um, you know, the fact that we have referenda and deck democracy is not like some geological accident that there are mountains here. These are institutions that were designed. So uh, what you may have to say about, you know, how this kind of thing plays out, how does that fit with what seem to have been the intentions of people who established these institutions for initiatives and referenda? Thank you. That's a great question. So um, the, the, in the referendum process in and of itself is a legacy of the progressives, right? The progressive movement of the turn of the century, the 19th century, or the, sorry, the 20th century. And so um, initially these things uh, were, conceptualized and enacted to be able to bypass the monopoly on the legislature that the railroads had at the time, right? So at the time there were railroad barons, uh, I think it's like 1910, 1912, railroad barons were taking over and they had uh, actual 
actually bought seats like they had paid and bribed and bought legislators in the California uh, assembly and uh, and in other places in the West. Uh, and so this was enacted as a way for um, citizens to bypass special interests which is really interesting, right? Because it seems like it's just like a turnaround. Now it's like special interest bypassing the people, right? Um, most Americans are most Americans support the idea of uh, driver's licenses for undocumented people. They support the idea of like making undocumented people have insurance, right? They support uh, pathways to citizenship. Most Americans are okay with that. Uh, and it seems like uh, there's a, an ever, uh, an ever, uh, um, reducing group of people that want to kind of fight back against that. Um, but the other part of this is, you know, if you look at the two by two table, there's two cells at the top that are unbothered at the moment, right? And so part of my larger book project is I actually go to places that have closed opportunity structures, right? So places that don't have referendums or initiatives and look at um, how they uh, how groups in that area were able to enact or not enact, uh, how they were able to or fail to enact uh, in-state tuition for undocumented students. So I went to Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, who were considering un, um, legislation to uh, allow undocumented students to pay in-state tuition. And um, the results were pretty much what I'd expect in a place where, or what you would expect also in a place that doesn't have direct democracy mechanisms. So, um, you know, it's it's a different thing. I think the person that invented, uh, uh, the person that invented fireworks, you know, didn't intend for them to become used to, for as gunpowder, right? So, yeah. If I can follow up. Sure. Yeah, well, obviously, Alfred Nobel and Dynamite is the yes, uh, exactly. Dynamite. reference there. Yeah. However, um, I'm afraid I somewhat feel taken aback. Um, you know, you know this. Um, okay, one a kind of heads up, and it's a problematic context. But next week, talk from looking at the part of the paper raises so much more fundamental issues of majorities and minorities in, shall we say, a very problematic and historically tragic and sure. racially charged context. So yeah, yeah. anybody thinking about that, which, but some of these in terms of democratic process and where do minorities or different groups have a chance to have different voices is important. And then the other, you know, I mean, I'm afraid I don't share your optimism about majorities in terms of our current situation. I mean, we just seem to be in such peril that you have a basically minority group, you know, deliberately scheming and using its political power to keep themselves in power in ways that are profoundly dangerous. So for me, that seems to raise very important questions about, you know, these institutions and how they can be used and abused and manipulated. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I definitely agree, like, they're not being, they're being used and manipulated. I agree with that. I, I don't know if I made that clear. Like, it's people that, like, don't know what they're doing, <laughs> that don't that have no idea what they're doing. I mean, like, Prop 187 was written by, like, a failed accountant uh, and a lady that has her own, had her own page on the, um, on, like, an anti-hate uh, website the southern the southern poverty and law center she has her own dedicated page right and so like the people that are writing these pieces of legislation are definitely using them or these bills and these initiatives are definitely using them for uh less than honorable purposes so i agree next we have jamie yeah um I, you know, regardless, I think it's fascinating that ordinary people can make pieces of legislation and, you know, and have them get noticed. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the idea of self-governance that Vincent and Eleanor talked about. So I think we should have a lot of respect for their initiative and their ability to, to learn the rules of the game and to seek advice from people who know how it works. Um, I was curious, though, about, about states that have referendum options versus those that don't. Um, like, I don't, I don't know which states do and don't like how many, 
relatively speaking, how many states in the US have that option and how many don't? Um, is it like a minority of states or majority or what? That's a great question. So uh, the answer is like all great answers in political sciences, it depends. It depends on the type of, uh, the, it depends on the type and the quantity, right? So like I said, uh, Indiana has a referendum, so it has a direct democracy mechanism. And that mechanism is that legislators can introduce uh, initiatives, right? Um, not people, right? But, uh, uh, but legislators. About six states have uh, a, a, a large number of initiatives, referendum, right? So they have multiple types of direct democracy mechanisms, but almost every state in the union has some type of direct democracy mechanism. Right, maybe uh, the ones on the west that have that were more influenced by the progressives have multiple types and more uh, open, even more open, right? Um, direct democracy mechanisms, um, but it really it really does depend. The other thing I'll say is that you're you're uh, it may it may it, it is true. I think I agree with you uh, when I don't know if this is kind of the the point that you're trying to make, but like, you know, it's really just happening in a couple of states. Like, who cares, right? Like, also, the thing, Prop 187 in 1994, uh, the language, the ideas are the same language and idea that we see in the 1996 uh, Personal Responsibility and uh, Work Act that the Clinton, that the Clinton administration signed. So everything that we see, um, with respect to how uh, immigrants can uh, apply or when and under what conditions immigrants can apply for assistance, uh, in-state tuition, whether they can attend school, whether they can, uh, uh, whether they have to pay in-state or out-of-state tuition, like all of those things, the lettering, the letter of Prop 187 is included in uh, the 1996 uh, Personal Responsibility and Work Act. So yes, you're right. It it really is kind of uh, housed ar around a few a few states, but the impact of what those things are doing, right, is reverberating nationally, right. So, um, you know, when Ofer won that referendum, they won that referendum, right? When they won that referendum, you know, federal uh, representatives took that as a mandate. Right, same thing with Prop 187. Federal gov federal representatives took that as a mandate that they could move forward with restrictivist policies if the most um, liberal state in the union could pass a piece of legislation like that. Right, so um, that's the thing that kind of makes me think twice. Like that really blows my mind. It's like this doesn't really happen very often. Like not all states have an initiative process. They don't, not all states have a referendum process. And yet it's these states that are pretty much setting the pace for the types of immigration policy that we see at the federal level. And it makes it even worse in the face of federal inaction. Jamie, did you have any follow-up questions before we move to James? James, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I did have my hand up, and it was more just a, a comment as you move into thinking about food systems, and particularly when I when I think back to the ref, referendums here in the Midwest, it seems like a lot of them center on the Right to Farm acts that have been passed. I know Ohio recently had one in the past ten years, and and several other states. And it, and I mean, I, I think what I find interesting is what those uh, referendums actually are trying to accomplish versus how they're communicated and what they're trying to accomplish. And um, I don't know, it's just just a thought as you move forth, uh, if, if you, you know, if, if you go down, you know, how far you go down that path. Um, but it just sort of the difference in like, I feel like what the bill or what the referendum is actually putting in the law versus what is the like messaging uh, are, are very different things and, and, trying to understand the general public's grasp of the issues uh, is, I think it would be a really fascinating um, uh, yeah, research to engage in because I don't really, I, would, I wouldn't hypothesize that the general public really understands what they're checking that box, yes or no on, uh, when it comes to some of these items. 
Um, and I, I suspect it's very similar, uh, no matter if it's driver's licenses or, uh, you know, forever hunting rights like in Indiana or, um, you know, right to farm uh, legislation a referendum in Ohio. So just more of a comment, but I think uh, you could obviously uncover some really fascinating, uh, you know, outcomes there. You know, I, I actually did speak with some people, uh, with some groups that interacted with the um, that interacted with the petition takers, at, with respect to putting uh, 833 on uh, on the referendum, and and you know when they what they told me or what I was told was that they were never ex they never explained to uh, petitioners what they were signing. Right, they they just said, "Oh, yeah, this is a bill. This is for driver's license for undocumented people. Like, sign it. Like, you know, to make it sound like it was a good thing, um, you know. But people don't know that that bill had already been signed, and this was actually a referendum to like question or stop that, right? And so, um, yeah, people are really sneaky, <laughs> really sneaky and uh, good. They they were very good. I'll say they were very good uh, at mobilizing their resources." Right, it is very, fascinating how the process actually unfolds on like with boots on the ground yeah, and, and the messaging and like local newspapers and local television stations and whatnot. It's um and how that's all communicated. So, but yeah, I'm not, that's I'm, a whole I, other. Yeah. I'm not in the media school, so but I just would find that an interesting part to this. So, yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank I you for joining down. us today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Do we have a last question before one o'clock? Yeah, Jamie, go feel free. Yeah, there's another way that you might want to first build out your research as well in this area. And so right now you're looking at, you know, legislation to open up certain benefits for undocumented immigrants and looking at like restrictive immigration groups. But what if you flip, turn that table around and looked at like legislation that was trying to restrict immigration rights and then look at what um, Let's you know, like open open immigration groups are trying to do. I'm sure that's got to exist in some places too. Um, so that might, yeah, that'd be, be interesting to see. Yeah, so that's um, that is kind of what um, the second part of this project is. So um, you know, Wisconsin was really interesting, um, and in a way that. Uh, during the beginning of what it, the idea of in-state tuition occurred during two different um, gu gubernatorial administrations, right? One was very progressive and the other was restrictive. It was like, I don't remember what the progressive guy was, but I remember Scott Walker. I don't know if that name rings a bell. Uh, he's one of the most uh, restrictive uh, governors. Like he really, uh, he invalidated like unions in Wisconsin. Like it was like a, a big, big thing. Um, and so, uh, part of that work, part of this work is to kind of see how groups acted to protect this thing that the governor was trying to repeal, right? And so, but I think you're absolutely right. It, it's, um, it's, imp it's important, right? Um, this was just a kind of an interesting case to me as well. And so I wanted to kind of follow up with what was going on, but um, yeah, I think that's great. Like, I think I'm gonna, I wrote that down. So I think maybe I will consider that. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Silva. So there are some comments in the chat. So if you want to stick around and copy those out, I know Brian shared a link about Florida. Um, but thank you uh, very much for joining us today to talk about direct democracy mechanisms and those actors who uh, participate in using those mechanisms. And thank you everyone for joining us this Monday afternoon. We very much appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you. <laughs>